Yes. So, okay, there we go. So I'm Karen Sullivan, publisher of Arenda Books. We're a small independent publisher based in London. We publish literary fiction with a heavy emphasis on crime thrillers and about half the list is in translation. Uh, last year, we won the CWA Crime and Mystery Publisher of the Year. And we've just been shortlisted for the Small Press of the Year in the British Book Awards. Uh, tonight, we are chatting to two immense authors to launch the fifth book in the six story series, Matt Bezalowski's Deity. So widely known as the Dark Prince of Northumbrian Noir, <laughs> Matt and I go a long way back. So I was one of the judges at the Bloody Scotland Pitch Perfect event when he presented his debut thriller, Six Stories, and I was immediately enchanted by the original podcast concept. Um, and when the book was delivered, his powerful writing completely won me over. Um, he touches not only on social issues and highly relevant themes, um, and he writes teenagers with such authenticity, I was suspicious that he might be one. Um, but he also pushes the boundaries of the crime fiction genre in a, a hugely exciting direction. Um, his sense of place is second to none and his ability to veer into horror and the supernatural, it feels natural and exceptionally special. Spooky. Um, there are a there are a few people who don't spend a couple of hours on Google uh, after reading a six stories thriller, and I'm very very proud to publish this series and to work with Matt. Um, he actually he is an incredible talent, but he's also so humble um, and lovely, and always willing to explore every option to make his writing better and better with every single book. And I really think this is the best one yet. So joining him tonight, we have Katriana. Um, whose upcoming psychological thriller, I, I, think, I think it's a psychological thriller. There's certainly a lot of mm. psychological elements, horror, gothic, it's a lot of things, isn't it? Um, the Last House on Needless Street has been making waves for months now in advance of publication next week. Um, I read it a few months ago. This is a proof, actually. Um, and I can't tell you how much I loved it. Um, it's dark, it's original, it's, it's a heart-wrenchingly moving um, with a breathtaking concept. And and um, it's the kind of writing where you feel compelled, actually, to underline passages. I certainly did. So this is from an astonishing author, and we're really honored to have Kat here tonight with us. She, it's something fresh, intelligent, bringing, again, something really new to the, to the genre. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, leading the proceedings tonight, we have the amazing Dr. Noir. Uh, this is Dr. Jackie Collins. She's founder of Newcastle Noir Crime Festival and a crime fiction aficionado. She's a former senior lecturer at Northumbria University in literature, film and TV and Spanish language and culture. I can say that Jackie now without even having to look at my notes. <laughs> She's currently based at Stirling University in Scotland, and she's coming to us live from Edinburgh. Jackie co-hosts a fortnightly crime fiction radio program on Spice FM, and she hosts literary events with the Honey and Stag events team and is a member of the Coralist Books team, which is a new independent publisher of translated crime fiction from Romania, Iceland, and beyond. She has worked closely with us um, since I founded Aranda Books, and she's not just a huge inspiration and support but a wonderful friend and one of the most knowledgeable people in the crime fiction world so welcome Jackie, Kat and Matt so that I, I thought oh god that sounds so awful doesn't it work? <laughs> anyway I must just say that signed copies of Deity are available now um, from foreign books there are partner bookshop in Corbridge um, you can pre-order signed copies of I'm just looking up the email address here um, you, of The Last House on Needless Street too so we have a long-standing relationship with Helen and James and the team at Forum Books and we've launched all of the six story series from the shop and it's a shame not to be there this year but we will definitely be back. In fact, one of the very last events we did last year before the Aranda Roadshow was Matt's launch there um, for Beast. So it seems a long time ago. Um, Forum Books absolutely exemplifies the power of an independent bookshop. They have hand sold literally thousands of copies of Matt's books and we are enormously grateful for their enthusiasm, support and incredible effort. So you can tweet them at Forum Books visit www.forumbookshop.com where there is a direct link to order both of these books or you can email them on hello at forumbooksandkids.com and 
as always, I'm just going to say we depend so much on our independent bookshops for so many mm -hmm. reasons. And if we don't support them, we are going to lose them. Um, a lot of them are just about managing um, throughout all of this. A lot of them are not. So if you can put your money in that direction, it would be so appreciated. And on that note, I'm going to do, oh, I was just going to say there's a chat, a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, just fire them throughout the um, the event and we will stop well before the end so that you can get some answers to them. But for now, I'm going to turn you over to the brilliant Jackie and Matt and Kat. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you for that. What an absolute fabulous evening. I know we can't all be together physically, but just the prospect of getting together this evening to celebrate an amazing book launch, Deity. Um, thank you, Matt, for creating yet another fabulous novel in the, in the Six Story series. And then to be joined by another utterly amazing author. I have to say, I've never had a book post that has left me so utterly dazed in a beautiful way, challenged and left feeling that I don't think I'll ever read like that again. So it's like to both of you, Matt and Kat, thank you so much for those awesome, awesome reads. And please, just to the bodies out there, if you want to take a challenge, if you want to step away a little from the, the familiar, and the familiar is brilliant, we love our familiar patterns, in it, especially in our crime novels. But if you want to take a chance on something that it will literally take you elsewhere and make you consider what it is you're, you're, you're reading, then please do pick up a copy of both of these books. But anyway, enough from me. Matt, if I can ask you first, um, to be here at book number five, how does that feel that you know that journey from 2016 to now what what's that feel like man it feels it, it only really feels like it was yesterday that i just finished six stories i still feel almost like an amateur um because i think i i want to every book to be the absolute best it can be and so with every book i feel i have to step it up and it has to be better than the last one. It has to be twice as good as the last one. So there's a, a huge sense of responsibility <laughs> with these books, which was never supposed to be a series um, and weirdly became a series. But the more, the, uh, the more books I write, the more ideas that come. So it's like a perpetual circle of inspiration, writing, horror, pain, and then joy at the end. I enjoy at the end. Well, many, many congratulations uh, on, on the publication of, of Deity. Um, where are you at? Because you're, you're, you know, you're online journalist, you're online investigator, shall we say, Scott King. How do you feel about him now? It's, it's always something that fascinates me, an author's trajectory from when you were first acquainted to now and, and do you feel differently are you fonder of him is he growing on your nerves I don't know tell us where are you at with Scott yeah so Scott was never supposed to be a character in himself he was always supposed to be just a, a narrator he was supposed to be a faceless uh, curator of the story and it was always about the story but I found with any good writing and Kat I'm sure you'll know this too the more you try and write around something or someone the more they kind of reach their hand and grasp at you and pull you kind of into their world and that's what was kind of happening with Scott King and I I gave him a little bit of peril in the second book um and then the third book became a little bit more about him I feel I still feel he's quite an enigma to me um I don't think I'm ever really going to understand him um but he's, it's, he's a constant, he's there. He is almost my anchor when I'm writing. I know I can rely on him. He's that one voice that I don't struggle with because I can go back to him and he can help push me on. Sometimes he asks stuff that I don't know he's going to ask. And that's kind of nice because the longer we've been together, sort of surfing this strange world of supernatural and true crime, um, he's become the reliable narrator in the world of unreliable narrators, I think. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Matt, in, in a little minute, I'm going to ask you to come back and, and take us into the book, if you will. But but what you've just said, it, it, if it's OK, I'll just turn to Kat and, and that notion of the unreliable narrator. Um, because the last house on Needless Street seems to be populated, shall we say, Exclusively, yeah. almost, by the unreliable narrator. Yeah, yeah and, and, and I wondered when, you know, when you were creating this, this just tremendous piece of writing, did you struggle not to write the reliable narrator or was, did it flow really well to be so unreliable? I suppose, I suppose that, in a sense, all... I always think that any any first person, any I narrator is inherently unreliable anyway. You can't uh, tell uh, an objective truth um, to the reader in it through through that voice, can you? Because you're always you're always you're always implying um, that the, the and, and foregrounding the fact that you're talking through their their lens exclusively. And the reason you choose it is because it is a subjective lens. Um, and it, it's also now by this point, I think it's almost like a little, almost like a little kind of like, um, almost, not an in joke, but a little signal to the reader subliminally that you're in a place where perhaps not not all the information can be can be trusted. I was just thinking about deity though, because I was thinking about this this morning when I was finally finishing it, which is fantastic, fantastic experience, and it closes with a bang. But um, that idea of um, horror needing a witness you know you, you need you need someone to see it and you need it's a very gothic trope isn't it to have the internal um, seemingly impartial witness um, and I thought that he serves that function really really well and but there is something ambiguous about him isn't there like I always wanted him to, to end up I don't know being a bit of a wrong <laughs> It's interesting, isn't it? Because when the more reliable someone is in a book, the more the doubt creeps in. And I often think like what you just said there made me think of when of, of Lovecraft stories, yeah. when he goes from this first person, it's always like some bloke who's gone to look at a tower for three days on his own. And like, so he's seen some like tentacled horror, but you think, mate, why have you gone to look to live in a ruin for a week? Like what's yeah. going on with you, why mate? Why were you there? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know. Um, and it's all that sort of idea, the idea of the relentless documentarian as well, the organizing almost editorial hand, which makes it sort of suspect because it has such inherent power. It has literally like that it has it has the ultimate authority in the narrative is like who chooses what goes where and when so it's it's a it's a very interesting character and i think you i think you i think you inhabit him really well because you just there's just you trust him but you also there's that edge of that edge of just wondering you know mm -hmm. so if i can just stick with you for a minute because i'm intrigued um the edge the edge of wondering um the characters that populate your book cat i have mm. to ask you about olivia the cat yeah um and i, I know th the finding of that voice well okay. she, to, she, to see she, the world as a cat sees the world she just she walked in like cats do she just <laughs> walked into the book <laughs> um it, you know you find them outside the back door she was just waiting there to waiting to come in and um and then of course out again and then in again and out again but um she um she i, I think she it, it's not an easy book necessarily it's got there are there are difficult it's it, there are difficult thing difficult you know subjects in it and it deals with the way the mind organizes itself with dealing with trauma and things like that and what i I find that she's she's such a she's such a naughty, insolent, quite cat-like voice, but she performs the same function in the book as she does for the main character, Ted. So she provides that comfort and that sort of um, and there's, there's something reassuring about a cat not giving a shit about you. Do you know what I mean? Like there's something reassuring when there's something you just like, you know someone doesn't really care that much. You're like, oh, that, that really makes me feel quite safe, strangely. So I think she's 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 a necessary presence in a book that's full of horror. But I was surprised because I don't. She's more, she's more, she's more of a um, 
she's much more of a comic character than I ever envisaged her becoming, you know, because she's just so her much herself. She doesn't mean to be funny. She just, just she just is what she is. She, and I found myself thinking, like, it, having a lot of fun in, in an unexpected way. I, d- I, didn't, I didn't know that I was going to enjoy writing that character at all. In fact, it was the most fun I've had, I think, ever, really. Well, she was, she was certainly fun to read, um, without a doubt. Um, but you, you talk, and I'm going to come back to you, Matt, because that, that notion of writing difficult, uh, unpleasant topics, themes, um, and with deity, could you, again, without giving too much away, if nobody's had the pleasure yet, could you tell us about the topic that you seem to draw out here and, and, and how you dealt with, with immersing yourself in that to write the book? Well, I think the, there's a few sort of big topics going through deity. And I think there's sort of on the surface, it's the idea of um, how much can someone get away with uh, on, if they're on a pedestal? How much can fame allow you to just do what you like? <clears throat> but I think the other thing is, is about us as fans and us as people who worship deities and what, where do we put ourselves and how do we feel when our heroes fall? and our heroes turn out to be something that we didn't expect and we didn't want to expect. And I think that's where the hard bit is because then you have to go, almost go back in time and change around how you feel about someone or something that you loved. Um, a really interesting case in point, and it was happening as I'd finished the book and as I was kind of putting the last edits to was the allegations, and I'll stress that word, against Marilyn Manson, who's a, who was a huge hero of mine. And, and his music meant a huge amount to me when I was younger. And now I have to go and, and look at that again. And I think that was, that was what was pouring out of the book, this idea of where do we as, as fans place ourselves. And I think a really interesting there's loads of ways you can address it and you can be very serious about it and you can be and I found that when I was writing I was quite serious about it and I found that I had to be very careful as I was writing and trying and just in things like language there was a passage where I talked about um when people are known as victims or um accusers and what an interesting piece of language and it's almost like if I hit you right now you would be the victim of my fist right but you wouldn't be the accuser of Matt Veselovsky. Do you know what I mean? It's, mm-hmm. it's, and it's funny, it's interesting how we use it, but what I really loved in Needless Street was when we talk about the cat character was almost like a bit of comic relief. And then uh, obviously I'm not going to go too far into it, but I thought that's a really interesting way of dealing with a big issue as well. And that doesn't make it more, any more or any less. It's a different way of looking at it. I thought mm-hmm. that was used like so powerfully um, it was quite wondrous mm. those who don't know it's, uh, this is Olivia who is a cat who thinks she has a special relationship with God and oh. she's chosen she's chosen by the Lord to do his bidding I and mean, she's only met one person in her life which, who's her owner Ted so she thinks all people are called Ted's um, <laughs> and she's just she's very disapproving of, of his lifestyle but still you know just thinks he might turn out all right in the end if he's properly managed you know I, it I was so you're... wondrous and so childlike, but yet there was that menace behind it, which I thought was so, like, so strong. It was bubbling beneath it. And I think that's what just kept me absolutely hooked to Needless Street. It's just, I, I, yeah, it's that relentless sense of like, oh, but it's not like that, is it? Is it? Is it? What's <laughs> underneath? What's sure. underneath? What's boiling underneath? Which is uh, what, exactly this, exactly the sort of anxiety that fuels deity, isn't it? It's like you're yeah. assembling the the evidence and the information, but unfortunately, you're ne- you you can't you can't ever have that objective proof put in front of you. Uh, so there is that constant knowledge of of, of facts eluding your grasp and yeah. What, to put your to put your to put your fear or to put your trust mm-hmm. and the wanting you know do i want to uncover the reality here do yeah. i want to know what you know what is actually going on um mm-hmm. and and i wonder you know do, do you both bring us that 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 feeling you know you enable us to feel that within the safety of a book uh, a feeling that maybe with regard to real life 
yeah. is often just too big. It's too big to pull back those layers and and take a a, a, a proper long look at. I, mm. Just to come back to to what you were talking about, Matt, um, and I'm going to start taking some of the questions because I don't want to miss any people's questions. Um, and and Mary, hey Mary Pickin, Mary asks, can you divorce the music? So going back to to what you were saying about Marilyn Manson. Can you divorce the music from the man when it comes to serious allegations? That's a really, really hard question. It's something that I think we have to look at a lot more. Um, be, when I was really, really young, I think the first musician I ever really loved as a genuine fan was Michael Jackson. And now saying that now mm. feels dirty to say that. Yeah. And I was convinced, and I'll freely admit this, I was convinced he was innocent of everything until I saw the documentary um, from the two victims. And I suddenly thought, oh my, I need to, I need to have a look at myself. Um, I personally, I think it's all down to the person. I can't listen to Michael Jackson anymore. I haven't listened to Marilyn Manson since the allegations have come up because for me and for me personally, those people were more than just their music. Yeah. They were about the image. Um, believe it or not, I took a lot of influence from Marilyn Manson. Um, <laughs> their, their image, their, their outlook, their ideas shaped a lot of my life. So it feels like I've lost a lot of my life to someone terrible. Um, yeah. Kat, you wanted to. No, I was just jump thinking in. about it. I felt something similar, although it was on a slightly small, lesser scale with David Bowie, you know. Mm. I felt I felt that I felt a great sort of loss of of something which had been really like a source of uh, you know in, inspiration and creativity had would been taken away. Yeah, I saw a lot. I, I thought there was some there was like that was also was such an interesting way you managed to really seamlessly blend all like there were suggestions of all those people in in the figure of Zach Crystal weren't there really like there's some David Bowie and some Marilyn Manson lots of Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah Michael Jackson I think was the biggest influence but I wanted him to be I wanted him to be that amalgam of those people those untouchable yeah. almost ethereal people because yeah. we don't look at people like Jackson and Manson as just a fella in some makeup doing a dance or singing a song we look yeah. at them as something beyond mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and we define ourselves through them we define ourselves as fans like David Bowie fan, like you're saying about David Bowie, you define yourself. David Bowie's defining part of your life, those lyrics, everything, they're part of you. And, and a part when he's gone, for someone who it meant a lot to, that part of you is dead, you know? Yeah, I'm thinking about, I mean, it's, I'm just, originally, I'm this, thinking about it in terms of writers, because that, that, I remember having this sort of discussion about, I can't remember who it was, but it was someone who was dead. And I thought, yes, that's easier, as, isn't it? It's easier if they're dead. Mm. Mm -hmm. um because at least on a very simple level you're not giving them any money <laughs> um and um and there's something there's there's something about not you know you're not personally subscribing to them because they're not here anymore but uh, and but yeah it, it remains a knotty knotty problem it does and i think it's all that like i don't think there's a right or a wrong way to do it it's it's down to you as a person you know and how you feel about it and because there are some people who can separate who can just go well, that's music that's the person that's fine. Yeah. Personally. Like. No, but also mm. there's so there's it's such so interwoven, like the, the the mythos of the of the persona and the personal life as well. And you're being is an art just inviting that's all it is, isn't it? Essentially, is art inviting you into an intimate space with someone. It's like reaching out a hand and inviting you into their experience. It, it is an intimate thing. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. definitely uh, thank you both for it can often be a tricky discussion but I think you know I think we we dealt with that one beautifully thank you both Matt I wonder if you would give us a treat and read to us oh okay then. okay so I'm going to read a very short extract from the opening of Deity extract from Talk Sport the Boswell and Murphy breakfast show 14th of the 9th, 2019, 7.26 a.m. We're taking your calls this morning on Zach Crystal. Yes, that's right, the Zach Crystal, who I'm sad to say was confirmed dead at 5 a.m. this morning. 
Fire scene investigators up at Collie Cree National Park in the Scottish Highlands have confirmed the remains of the superstar were found among the ruins of his 500 acre property. What a tragedy. Well, I don't think it's a tragedy, Morris. Here we go, we've got Martha on the line. Not a tragedy, you say, Martha. Not at all. The bloke was a bloody weirdo, wasn't he? There were all sorts of rumours. Those two poor girls, what were found in his forest. Awful business, wasn't it? Martha, these are unsubstantiated rumours. None of it was proved. Lived in a treehouse, didn't he? With a load of teenage girls. That's true, in it? Good bloody riddance, I say. Thanks, Martha. What do you think, Neil? I mean, the guy was a musical legend, wasn't he? He can't be a legend without being a bit odd. He lived in a haunted wood, didn't he? True, true, he did spend a lot of time with teenage girls as well, though, didn't he? The guy was in his 40s, for God's sake. Oh, no, oh, no, but this is Zach Crystal we're talking about. Think of all the work he did for charity. It wasn't his fault that some silly teenagers got themselves lost in the Scottish islands, was it? They knew the dangers going in. There's wild cats and all sorts of things in there, aren't there? We'd love to hear what you think on Boswell and Murphy in the morning. So text or tweet us. Better still, give us a call. Zach Crystal, what legacy will his death leave behind? Nice. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. And I'm pleased to, to hear that nobody walked off the show like a certain someone did this morning. <laughs> Can we just do a thing? Uh, yeah. Jackie, will you just call me diabolical? Matt Wesselowski, you're diabolical. Mate, you're diabolical. See what I did there? Acted like an adult. Yes. <laughs> that is the way to do it. But seriously, Matt, thank you for, for, for reading to us and the voices there. In, I, I, there's a question from Becky Ulverscroft and it fits beautifully in, into what you've just done. Because um, she says, speaking of narrators and the discussion we were having before, do you hear the voices of your characters while writing? And how does this translate into audio for you? So yeah. those voices you've given us, are they what you hear when you write these people? Yeah, they often are. Like, because I listen to a lot, like, um, I, I do, I'm a very sort of tidy and cleaning sort of person. So I listen, like most of my readings done through audiobooks and podcasts. I listen to a lot of stuff. I've always got context, otherwise I'm stuck with my own brain and no one wants that, trust me. Um, <laughs> so... The voices have to be really strong. So when I'm writing, it's all about the cadence of voices and it's all about the rhythm of voices. And I have to hear characters' voices. And often they come quite quickly. So if I'm thinking of a character to be interviewed, their voice, I guess a good way to put it was, I listened to an interview with Steve Coogan talking about the creation of, the, of Alan Partridge. And they said he did this voice and within five minutes, they'd all chipped in and they had the character. He was there, he was done, he was this local radio presenter. They knew what car he drove just from doing this little voice. And I think that's, that's almost how these characters come. They come sort of, the voice says so much about them. So yeah, I have to hear them and I, and, and I have to stay with them and I have to get them down or else they kind of disappear. Thank you. <laughs> Fabulous. So if I can ask you both, and I, I'll come to you, to, because I, I'd like to get into the notion of a, a certain setting within within your books and that of the forest, the wood, um, the dark place. Uh, that's not to say there aren't other dark places within these two novels. But were, Kat, were, you, were you sure from the outset that there would be this dark area this place apart yes um for a start i just think so the last house on needler street i probably should have done this earlier i'm terrible at this <laughs> is um very briefly about a man a lonely man called ted who lives in a house at the end of needler street which is in uh, washington state at the edge of this great wild roiling pacific northwest forest um and uh, he lives with his cat olivia and his daughter lauren and then uh children have been going missing in the area for years and then unsolved disappearances and a woman who thinks he might be responsible have something to do with it moves into the vacant house next door and starts spying on him and then Ted's own daughter goes missing and things unfold from there but the the forest is is, is um is, is, was key to it I mean I think I was really what it's always ha had real hold on my imagination that part of the world because it is the haunt of so many serial killers 
it is um, it is rich in disappearances. And partly because it's such an unusual environment. You've got those Jurassic sort of ferns that stand almost almost as high as your head. It's the only temp temperate rainforest in the world, I think. So it's really special ecologically. And it's got this very eerie atmosphere and these great hanging mosses. And the land can just swallow you up as it as it did and, 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 and has done for many, many, many people. Ted, Ted Bundy and um, Gary Ridgway and the I-5 killer and many many others all it it just was it's the perfect place to to go to get out of sight and just be and be lost and that particularly the lake Sammamish disappearances where Ted Bundy took two girls in one afternoon from a crowded lake shore this just it's it's it holds onto my imagination like a fist I can't comprehend how dreadful how how the the brazenness of it and also the, the pure greed of it you know and the 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 effrontery and it just it's, it's one of those it should be unimaginable but it isn't because someone did it someone did it yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and and going i think you know ch choosing that space where yes these things have happened in that that location and i think again yeah. that that anchors us back in in reality. Matt, yeah. you took us in your book. You took us to Scotland. Did you take us to a forest that that you know that you wandered and you you felt that evil creeping through the through the trees? It's funny, you know, because thinking Kat, about your forests too. Um, do you have an affinity with the forest and with the countryside? Because when I read your books, especially. Maybe not so much in Needless Street, but definitely in Little Eve. Like, they're so evocative. Your locations are so visceral. I could, in Little Eve, I was there. I could yeah. smell it. I, I could taste it. I could smell the soil and that sort of thing. Um, and I love the forest, but I always end up turning them evil. And I was wondering if you do the same, same sort of thing. In answer to your question, just for uh, Kat, I, I love the forest so much. I feel at home in a forest. I don't feel any fear in the forest. So I'm, I, I feel like I can make it scary if I want to. I want to make it deep and, and dark, but uh, to me, it's great. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's great too. But I also think it goes back to that thing of being, comp it's, it, it doesn't care about me, you know, which, which can be very chilling, but also, but also a wonderful thing. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean me well or ill. It just doesn't care. So it'll eat me or help me <laughs> inadvertently either way, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the wonderful thing about it. Just nature just does not give a shit. And that's, right. that's, that's powerful. That's more powerful in itself. I've got a cool story about a forest. Like very recently, we went for a big walk up in Simonside, which are like sort of the way, sort of, uh, some of the hills up in Northumberland where they have, there's an actual sign which warns you about these um, dwarf creatures that might send you uh, mm. Yeah, I forget what they're called now. Um, it's going to come to me later. But they send you off. They say you, you mustn't follow them or you'll, you might fall off a cliff. Well, that's just good advice. Well, it is, yeah. And I'm glad they have that, that up just to warn you. But uh, we're walking back. And we, we got a little bit lost. And we walked along this really long track. And my, my son, who's nine, decided he was going to lag behind a little bit, as kids do. And yeah. uh, we're walking along a really heavily wooded track. And so we're walking along and I look around and he's, he starts sprinting up to me, sprinting from it. And he's going, oh, dad, you know what? I was standing looking at the trees and I felt something growl and I just ran. Oh. I know. And I thought, son, you have felt that you have felt the forest. The forest has given you a little prod. <laughs> <laughs> you, you understand, don't you, how exactly what, how paganism evolved when you yes time you're just like well this makes complete sense <laughs> yeah totally like you stand in the in the in the yeah. silent woodland long enough you feel the presence you feel it it makes itself known to you and there's something so yeah beautifully evocative almost you can like i always think you can i can finally understand why people believe in a magic man with a beard in the sky when you stand in the woods i believe in the woods much more than i believe in a, in a magic man in the sky like i'm woods, right yeah the woods make a lot of sense not sure about the other thing <laughs> sorry amen <laughs> for that <laughs> and see so just if you'll allow us to to stay in the woods a little bit but only to to talk about because matt it's something that comes back time and time again in in your your work and it's those elements of folklore or the paranormal or the occult um 
you just know that it, it's going to be part of this narrative and and that sense of being able to learn more as well that you always reveal you know aspects that maybe some of us have not come across before what did you include in in this novel well originally in uh, in this it was supposed to be i was going to be writing about skinwalkers which are a really interesting phenomenon but some some things are just a bit too big and they, they weren't skinwalkers are a very american native american thing and i just i didn't feel like because i'm from Newcastle, so I didn't really <laughs> did ever even get that connection with a Native American myth. It just didn't work yeah. for me. But I remember, and I'm going to show you a book. So I've, I've, I've brought some down. If you remember this from when you were young, I was obsessed with this book when I was a kid, and uh, it's got in it um, a picture of a black shuck, which is a, a sort Ooh. of a death omen, which is a dog. And I'm just trying to find it here. But that was the big thing in deity was the idea of death omens. And you get a lot of those. Here we go. This terrified me when I was a kid. This picture haunted my dreams. Wow. I loved it. Yeah. And I loved the idea of like a, of a death spirit, um, of, of like an omen of something from nature almost warning you off. And, and Crystal Forest has its very own death omen I kind of don't want to reveal what it is but I thought that felt so much more right like it felt Scottish I wanted to write a Scottish legend in the Scottish hands and it had to feel right I couldn't be like the hoying skinwalkers into Scotland because it wouldn't work and it would feel like I almost feel a sense of responsibility for these old myths and folklore and I have to get them right and they have to land right I don't know if you feel the same part uh yeah I do I mean I yes because I, I mean one does make some of it up but it has to be it has to be something that as you say would fits organically into the place where you put it because place the place is is it's it's like you know it's the place where you grow your story everything everything comes out of the setting and the atmosphere so you've got to make sure it, yeah you've got to make sure it, it it's all congruent um but I do love making up a monster yeah yeah that's good and make and yeah and, and mon monsters and ghosts are like probably the most fun to do because they because they terrify us on a level that doesn't um shake hands with the rational world very much you know so like they, they don't have any relevance to things like fear of like real world things that really matter like paying a bill or someone leaving you or someone dying maybe these 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 things all could could happen but the fear of the things that could, <laughs> the fear of the things that that you conjure is sort of there's a special quality to it cat mm. at that point what you conjure i wonder would you give us a reading would that be possible oh yes um i think i should do olivia after after well i've talked about her now so you know she'll be upset if i don't if she um, um Okay. Olivia. I was busy with my tongue doing the itchy part of my leg when Ted called for me. I thought, darn it, this is not a good time. But I heard that note in his voice, so I stopped and I went to find him. All I had to do was follow the cord, which is a rich, shining gold today. He was standing in the living room. His eyes were gone. Kitten, he said, over and over. The memories moved in him like worms under the skin. There was thunder in the air. This was a bad one. I leant into him with my flank and he picked me up in shaking hands. His breath made roads in my fur. I purred against his cheek. The air began to calm. The electricity subsided. His breathing slowed. I rubbed his face with mine and his feelings flooded into me. It was painful, but I could take it. Cats don't hold on to things. Thanks, kitten, he whispered. You see, I was busy when he called, but I went to him anyway. The Lord has given me this purpose and I do it gladly. A relationship is a very delicate business. You have to work at it every day. Bless you for that. Thank you. I think, I know oftentimes people don't enjoy maybe doing a reading, but I think for both of you tonight, you know, to treat us from these texts, uh, it, that is tremendous. Um, I just want to take a couple more questions that, that people have, have sent in, if that's all right. And um, Book Trail 
sticking with because we've been talking uh, about location. And of course, um, Book Trail focuses very much on those locations in, in, in people's writing. Um, so those locations that have inspired you, um, and I know you've both mentioned real places, but in, in other novels that you've written as well, could you talk maybe about those places? Matt? Okay. Um, I mean, mine, uh, it, that tends to be woods, wherever, whatever I write. Um, but I, I kind of tried to branch out um, into writing sort of slightly urban, slightly more urban places in, in my second book, Hydra. And I think they're always based on real places. They're always, they always have a, a basis in somewhere where I've been. And it's not maybe the, the buildings or the roads, but it's the feeling, the feeling of a place. So I've grown up in Newcastle, which is like a big city, but it's also dead close to the countryside. So you can drive for 20 minutes and you're out in Northumberland. I've also lived for 10 years in Lancaster, which is kind of on the Northwest coast, which has a very different vibe to it, which was quite a small town. Um, and it, it was near the sort of filed coastline, which is where like Andrew Michael Hurley set one of his books with a very haunting oh, sort nice. of place. One, the Loney, it's amazing, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, phenomenal. And it's like he captured the mood of the filed coast so acutely and I, and I really like that. I, I kind of quite like run down places as well. I like a sort of Victorian seaside town that's seen better days. Do you know what I mean? I like taking moody photos of like a broken, like hut in the middle of a clearing that might have like a, a murderer or a creature in it. Do you know what I mean? Like a troll. Um, but yeah, I think like location is always an, a different amalgams of different places, but it's, it's always about the feeling a place gives you and the mood it evokes rather than just place. I found that my personal, like, I, I might, especially for Raw Blood, my first book, I, the, someone said to, me, said to me that once, I'm not sure whether it's right, but it certainly resonated, which is you set your first novel where your dreams are set. And my dreams are set on Dartmoor, inevitably, even now. And um, it just, it's a, it's a landscape that's made its way into my imagination. It's the setting for all of my, you know, my thought, like, my thoughts and my subconscious so that was an obvious choice and then Scott the, the Highlands was so my mother was born in Ayr and then she was taken when she was five to Zimbabwe or Rhodesia as it then was and grew up and she and her brothers have this longing it's like they talk about it all the time they, and her brothers still talk with Scottish accents and they're they're, they're very proud Scotsmen but there's this air of, you know, elegiac kind of nostalgia for something they never quite had. And I think, you know, because Little Eve is, it is about, it's about, a, it's about a, a kind of an in, in Englishness in Scotland and on, in, lo, on, in lots of ways and on lots of levels. There was, that made its way into, into it as well. So ideologically as well, that the landscape seemed to be exactly the right place to set that story. But I just like wild places, really. And there aren't so many of them left, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but I think what you both do is you provide us with external and both internal wild places. Mm. You know, um, the very inside, outside spaces where the wildness bleeds in and out. And it, yeah. yeah, take us on that, that journey. Before when we were talking about, we both felt that sort of pagan pull of the wilds. And maybe it's something akin to that. We're kind of, there's a primeval part of us reaching out and longing, longing for that wilderness, you know? Mm -hmm. could, could well be. I, and and I, I felt that pull in the books as well to, to go, to go into the forest, to go into to the dark places. Now I'm aware that there's, there's other questions we've not been to and I don't wanna leave people without them being answered. So um, Alexander Hawley, right at the beginning, I'm sorry just to get to this now, Alexander says, hi Matt, loving the audio discussion that we were having right at the beginning. Could you tell me how you came up with the idea of six stories as podcasts are pretty close to audio books as an idea? Yeah, it was actually uh, true crime podcasts that, that gave me the idea. I listened to the first season of Serial 
and boom, that was it. And I, I was obsessed with it, just like kind of we all were. Um, I came quite late to it as well. Someone recommended it to me and I couldn't, couldn't stop thinking about it. And I couldn't stop thinking about what an interesting new way it was to tell stories. And I thought, well, I was never a crime writer. I was always a horror writer. And I thought, well, I'll have a little shot at crime. I've never really read any crime. Um, but I thought, well, why don't I write a true crime podcast? <laughs> See what happens. Like it might be shit, but it might, and then it worked. <laughs> so it, it really was as simple as that. It was like, I'll, I'm going to give it a shot. I'll write a podcast like a book. Like I probably wouldn't read it, but I'll give it a, <laughs> I'll give it a blast. Wait a minute. What's that adage that says, write the book you want to read? <laughs> <laughs> Except this one. No. <laughs> yeah, then the idea grew on me and I wrote some more. <laughs> you wrote some more. Which runs lovely into the, the, the next question that's from Tina Kova. Uh, and, and she asks, here's a question for Matt. How many six stories books do you have plans to write? Do you have any ideas for novels stretching away into the future and plan them a long way ahead? Or do you simply write from scratch as inspiration strikes? Yeah, the second, like, I don't plan anything. Like, uh, I always go back to that wonderful Joe Hill quote where he says, uh, plots are where your characters go to die. <laughs> and I, I, I love that. Like, that's just for me, it doesn't work. I can't plan. If I plan, I get bored of it. Like, if I know what's going to happen, I can't be asked to write it. You know, like, it's, it's just, it's boring. I like to kind of write and see where it takes me, which is a nightmare for me, editor and publisher and agent. Like, <laughs> we have to constantly sort of delve through the, the, the chaff to get to the wheat. But that's, for me, that's the, that's the way to go. I do actually have some plans for six stories, but uh, I'm not going to tell you because they're not written. Um, so, yeah, there might be some more. Um, there might not be. Thank you. Sorry, Thank you that. that's, a really, that's a poor answer. No, it's great. It just leaves us wanting more and hoping that it will be there. Kat, you, you write standalones. Um, yeah, so from... Uh, Again, I was I was totally new to your writing when I received the copy of The Last House on Needless Street. It, it I think been... many people were. <laughs> oh, wow. But it's just like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I think I'm at that point in life that says there are only so many days left. And, and oh, my God, without wishing to sound doom and gloomy. But I have to get the rest of your books into the life that I have left. There's no doubt about it. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. No, no. That's a wonderful thing to say. Uh, and and I, I just... You know, from the outset of becoming an author, were you, were you sure that you didn't want to go down the path of any writing any kind of serial? I'm still not sure that I don't. I, 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 I think, I think I have sort of sort of ideas kicking around because I think it, there's something there's a different challenge in doing something sustained that that revisit that built that does you know world building with each you know and, and exists in the same universe each time I, I've, I've never done that and I always think it's <laughs> it's a good idea to always do things that you think will be very hard uh, and I think that's probably very hard um, as Matt will know um, but I it's 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 tempting but the, uh, the problem is you see is everyone in my book starts out dead so it's very difficult to, to, carry, to have any sequels or continuation with the ones. Uh, I just, I, so to date, I've, I've found, I, I really embed myself in these big stories that turn on a hinge mm. and, um, and have a huge emotional... I, they, they, they are the stories that are the defining moments of, the, of these people's lives. There is no before or after, or if, or if there, if there is, it's, it's not, it's, it's not novel worthy. This is the novel worthy part of their lives. This is these are the epic moments. That's what that's what my novels have been so far. I think, you know, narratively, it's a different skill. I, I'd be willing to give it a shot, is all I can say, but not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit ambiguous as well. Mm, I, I take, I take what you're saying, but I just wonder by the end of the last house on Needless Street there is a sense of despite everything that you know that that we might say mm. that, that and maybe it was just my reading but there was a sense of there's a possibility of going forward and and that's not to say that you would write the going forward yeah i th i think it's i think yes i think it's 
I, I think it's some books, some books are just completely self-enclosing and some books, I think it's really important that you can, you can feel that these people had a life before and that you can feel that their life will go on after. And I do think those, they, it's not necessarily the same in each case, you know, sometimes people are born almost the characters seem to come into existence on you know in the first sentence and then after that you don't know anything else about them but I think Needless Street you there's a sort of perhaps there is a sense of you could I, gosh it's hard to talk about this isn't it um, <laughs> um I th- I think I think there is there is a sense of a wider world perhaps which could mm. be explored is that mm. yeah that's, that's right. thank you thank you for that and, and I think we should say in all fairness um there's something that that we can't talk about because you you all need to read the book before there can be a conversation about what the questions that I'd really like to ask Kat about it we mentioned this before so please everybody read the book and then we can have the conversation I think that's the that's the important thing Matt Matt can I come back to you because Andrew sent a question in and please do uh, viewers please do 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 put your questions up. Um, Andrew's asked, any plans to write a straight horror based on the creepy scenes you've written? It would be amazing. You know, like the most rejections I've ever had for anything I've written have been horror novels. Um, but I, I started, like I say, I started off writing horror and I've written, I've got loads of horror manuscripts which have been have been rejected so bad they're sort of cowering in a corner of my hard drive and they don't want anyone to look at them ever again. And <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'd lo- I'd love to, uh, and I feel that uh, I think my experience in crime fiction has shown me that I don't really have to stick to any sort. I don't go. I have to go out anymore thinking this is going to be this genre. I think it's about telling a story. Mm-hmm. So I've just um, completed something which is on six stories related. Um, Again, though, might be crime, might be horror, might be a bit of both. I don't know. Um, but as for six stories, I think with, with those, again, they they are they are now the books I want to write. I wouldn't write them if I didn't want to tell those stories. So something of horror may come. But I feel with horror, there's so many giants in the horror scene. There's so many good horror writers that you've really got to be exceptional. Um and that's like, for example, like, and I'm going to go on about Needless Street because I loved it. Like, I loved it so much, but I also loved your other books as well. Like, all your books, Kat, they do something different for that genre. And again, I don't know if they're strictly horror um, or what, but it doesn't I matter. Don't, yeah, I don't know what horror is. I mean, I do, no. it, but I'm not really sure, you know. Anyway, go on. Yeah, that's it. And you those books, saying. it's about the story. You don't go in there going, I'm going to be frightened. Uh, you're not reading them thinking you're just being pulled pulled to pieces inside by them and I think that's what a good story does a good story leaves you with some kind of wound inside and that's what I want to do I want to leave people with wounds literary wounds Mm. oh leaving people with literary wounds it's beautiful and I also want to say to both of you um because just what you're saying Matt the notion of writing so that it does not fit neatly into a specific genre. Now, it might be a little bit difficult with regards to publicity and marketing and finding a place on a bookshelf in a bookstore. But I wonder, in this 21st century, are we at a place where we desire those texts that actually do challenge, you know, the straight jacket of a horror, a gothic, a crime fiction, a psychological novel that we're actually, you know, the reading public quite likes it when you fabulous authors blend these these different traits. I don't know. I think the, the public just want a good story. Just mm-hmm. they just want a good a good mm-hmm. story. Um like yeah, that that I always think that's marketing's problem to do that. You know, like yeah. like they can do that. I don't I don't really care. Like a good story is a good story and a good book is passed from word of mouth to word of mouth because it's a good story, you know, and and that's the bare bones of good writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think all good writing has horror in it anyway. Yeah. All good writing carries some terrible horror, everything from like even supposedly comic novels, like, I mean, maybe the most horror in them. 
Mm. Yeah, for sure. My son is reading this graphic novel at the minute and it's aimed at his sort of age. And it's like the most Lovecraftian thing I've ever looked at. It's called Amulet. And it's these children being attacked by these sort of shog, like these tentacled shogoth things. It's wonderful. And he, he lent to me, he said, Dad, you'd like this. And I'm all right then. Oh my God, this is meant. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, like we, we grow up with horror. Think of Roald Dahl. Roald Dahl's stories are full of horror. Yeah, full of horror, pure yeah. horror. Yeah. Like the witches, man. Yeah. <laughs> when the kid is stuck in the painting, that's that that will stay with me forever. Charlie in the Chocolate Factory is a is a freak show. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. So, so elements of horror, vital, vital in good writing. Um I am aware of the time. I, I don't know if other people have got any questions they'd like to put to the authors, but I wonder is it is it that moment for us to, to raise a glass? Okay, to Matt Veselovsky and to Deity, and to wish you all the very best. Thank you, Matt. Thank you Cheers. so much. Cheers. Cheers, Matt. Congratulations on a wonderful book. Oh, thank you, Kat, and congratulations to yourself. Um, and thank you for coming on my um, launch with me. It's, it, it's such a huge privilege having a writer of your calibre and uh, on with me. And it's so thank you so much. And um, I've just, before we go, I've, I've got to do one little thing about a frog, Jackie. Oh, Is of that, course. Can of I do course. the thing about you, you got, uh, Karen, are we allowed just a short story about the, the frog? Yeah, I, I actually want this to go on all night. I'm enjoying it. That's why I didn't come back. I was actually scheduled to come back a few minutes ago, but I didn't. Um, yeah. This is so good. I love this. Oh, thank you, Karen. Um, Okay, so the frog was, um, in these sort of uh, COVID times, we tend to go on, a, me and my girlfriend tend to go on an evening walk. We do a, we do, we're doing this sort of Kayla workout thing every night where you have to put your body through a lot of pain for half an hour. Um, and then <laughs> just no pain, not, nothing, nothing top shelf. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, we go for a walk afterwards to cool down and burn off a few more calories. Uh, and we're walking along the street and she screams at the top of her voice and grabs me. And I thought, oh my God, something terrible's happened. Uh, or she's seen a werewolf or something. And she goes, you nearly trod on that. And I look down, there's this, it must have been about this big, uh, a common frog just sat on the pavement beside a wall. A beautiful creature. You can have a look on my uh, Instagram. I think it's up there. Um, and what a beautiful creature a frog is. And so we thought there's a nature reserve, so about 15 minutes drive away. So we put it in a tub uh, and took it. And I'll tell you what, the frog was dead docile until you put it in a tub and then it went mental and <laughs> like trying to smash its way through. <laughs> Unbelievable. Don't uh, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I thought, well, um, I put out a competition because it's the launch and I'm feeling generous. I thought I said on my Twitter, if someone can come up with a good name for the frog, uh, I'll give you a shout out and you can have a signed copy of Deity. So I've read... Oh, wrong bookmark. <laughs> so yeah, I will sign you a copy um, and I, I just sort of DM me with your address. So I'm going to shout out Anne Blockswitch who... Uh, came up with a couple of good names, I believe her daughter as well. So we've got Sir Gilbert Crocolot or Ernesto von Hopalong. <laughs> and they, they tickled me. And, and so there you go. Thank you, Anne. Um, enjoy your book. <laughs> that's in the frog chat. The frog chat is that's, over. That's a frog clap. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think that we haven't got to all the questions, unfortunately, but... Um, <laughs> I'm going to avail you of Matt tomorrow. Um, he's going to go on and you can ask all of these questions again and he's going to answer them, right, Matt? Uh, yep. <laughs> he says, many new writers dream of being an Aranda author. What's it like to be part of Team Aranda? That means being totally bossed around, right? <laughs> um, it is very good and Karen is wonderful. And, oh. um... <laughs> be nice, Matt. No, it's great. It's uh, it's nice being part of a team because writing is such a solitary sort of uh, uh, job that when, when you with a render, it feels like people have got you back, um, and and that's really nice. Good. Well, you've signed. All right, Karen. All right. 
Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think that's probably it because Sophie, who is behind the scenes there, behind FMCM, is our PR and she probably would like to turn this off <laughs> and go and get some dinner. Um, and we'd like to thank Sophie for all her work. And I would like to thank Jackie for leading the proceedings so brilliantly tonight. That's a, that's a, thank you. Pat, thank you so much for coming. This is yeah. this was such, I mean, I really could have sat here and listened all night to you two because it was one amazing, interesting yeah. thing after another. Well, and we can do it again. Yes, please. Yes. Do it again. I really, seriously, really enjoyed it. We do a lot of these events um, and yeah. it was fabulous. Um, and I would like to, to remind you that signed copies of both books are available at Forum Books and we want to support this amazing independent bookshop. And I would like to thank all, all of you for coming along because it was a, an amazing evening. If um, if you want to talk about it with anyone else, we're going to have, we've recorded it and we'll put it up on our YouTube channel probably tomorrow or the next day um, and you can watch it again. Um, but for now, Thank you. I think we've got Deity launch next week. It's the last us on Needless Street launched. And what a fabulous evening. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you. Bye.